This morning's sermon and this afternoon's sermon, the Lord willing time come for that, will be quite fundamental and there will be an attachment between them for those who come and hear both of them. You will see that and yet both can stand alone. This morning uh, I would like to talk to you about salvation by works. James, in writing to the brethren, gives us our text, which you already know, for I quote it a lot. And that is that we have a perfect law of liberty, and that if we continue therein, doing those works will be blessed in our deed. Notice doing those works. Now, when you look round about you, you will hear, unless it's Roman Catholicism, that we have a system that does not save by works. Thus, you hear people talking about save by faith only. I say Roman Catholicism is an exception because they teach a salvation by works. They teach a salvation by meritorious works. Their idea is that if you have a scale up here and on my right hand this says good works and over here is my left hand evil works then if you can just get the good works heavier and outweighing the bad works meritorious works then heaven will be your home it was that kind of view that back in the 1500s 1600s people in Europe uh, fought against, and it's called the Reformation. They fought against a lot of other things, too, that were characteristic of Roman Catholicism at that time. But that's why they became known as Protestants. They protested. Thus, you talk about Protestant denominations today. They formed out of a protest of the corruption of the Roman Catholic Church. One of the good things they did, of course, was to get the Bible in the uh, languages of the people. And thus we have the great English texts that have come down to us, translations. But their great emphasis was a rebellion against meritorious works that I just mentioned. And thus they came up with the idea of salvation by faith only, which ran to the other extreme from salvation by meritorious works. But if we're going to systematically study this, we need to look at the different kinds, and let me underscore the word kinds, of works that are mentioned in the Bible. In uh, 1 John 3 and verse 8, we learn of the works of the devil himself, the works of Satan. John writing to Christians says, He that doeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. To this end was the Son of God manifested, that he might destroy the devil. Now remember, sin is the transgression of God's law. John tells us that in 1 John 3 and verse 4. And in Hebrews 2.14, the writer tells us that since then the children are sharers in flesh and blood, he also himself in like manner, speaking of Christ, partook of the same, that through death he, Christ, might bring to naught to nothing him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. And, of course, we see the very vague prediction that the seed of woman would inflict a mortal blow to the serpent, as it were, in Genesis 3.15. There's the first kind of works I want you to note in the Bible. Then there are the works of the law of Moses. Because by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. 
Paul writes to the church in Rome in Romans 3 and verse 20. But we further read about that idea in Paul's letter to the Galatians in Galatians 2 and verse number 16. He writes to them saying, Yet knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ, even we believed on Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ, and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Again, that's Galatians 2.16. So in Romans 1 or 11, in verse 6, he says, But if it is by grace or favor, it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. Well, we see the works of Satan. Now we see where in the context of these verses I've read, the works of the law of Moses. Now, the denominational world, those who teach that salvation is by faith only, think that today there is no law, that we're totally under a system of favor or grace, and thus their approach to these scriptures do not recognize them speaking of the works of the law of Moses. Paul is contrasting salvation through faith in Christ and the gospel system Remember, the gospel is God's power to save. He said that in the beginning of the book of Romans, Romans 1.16, with the very works that were demanded of the Jew under the law of Moses. So there's two kinds of works. Now let's look at the third one. These are the works that are invented and instituted by man. Not, of, not by works done in righteousness, which we did ourselves. But according to His, that's Christ's mercy, He saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. He said that that young preacher Titus, and Titus was to believe and preach this to others, Titus 3, 5. And then it's interesting that to another young preacher in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, he said, who saved us and called us with a holy calling, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before times eternal. Then in verse 10, but hath now been manifested by the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So we see the works of Satan are mentioned in the scriptures. We see the works of the Mosaic law. And we see works that are brought out by man, instituted by man. And then the last one, as you look at all the kind of works mentioned by God in the Bible, and that is the saving works of God. Jesus answered and said unto him, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. John 6, verse 29. Now today, among those people who believe that if you have salvation by grace, you're not under a system of law, they don't realize when they say all you have to do is believe in Christ. Why, Jesus said that belief was a work. It's a work of God. In Hebrews 5, the scripture is quite clear. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made in high priest. This is verse 5. But he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. And as he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers, supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, 
and was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, yet learned the obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. That's an important point to keep in mind, isn't it? Unto all them that obey him. I want to ask you a question. If Christ is the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him, and to obey anyone is to act or to work, then is it not clear that working the works that Christ has given us produces salvation? If not, how do you explain he's the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him? Obedience is action or work on our part. Therefore, we need to know in the right division of the word, 2 Timothy 2.15, that if you look at works in the Bible, you can't just say the only works mentioned are works of the law of Moses, are the works of Satan, are the works instituted by man, none of which can save a soul. But the works of God can save you. You know, we talk about the work of the Lord's church, and the church is the body of Christ, the family of God. And the church does the work of God. Well, how does the church, made up of individual Christians, do the work of God? It has to be through the truth God's given us, telling us what to do. That's action. But it didn't come from the law of Moses or Satan or was it instituted by man. It's the way we accept. Mark that. It's the only way we can accept what God's done for us we never could do for ourselves. It's the only way we can accept the favor of God that we do not deserve and cannot merit. That the law of Moses cannot extend to us. We read also in Paul's writings to the church in Ephesus. And remember all these people have been saved by grace through faith. They've been saved by the gospel which is God's power to save. Romans 1.16 And we read for by grace are you saved. Doesn't stop there though does it? For by grace favor you don't deserve. You cannot merit. The law of Moses cannot offer Certainly Satan doesn't offer it. For by grace are you saved, now watch it, through. That preposition through means an avenue where about reaches us. Through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. We should recognize then that grace can't reach us except through faith. But faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Faith rules in your life, in my life, as the word of God leads us, guides us, directs us, instructs us. And Christ saves us by his gospel as we hear and understand how to receive that salvation that we don't deserve and we cannot merit, does not come from Satan, and cannot be provided in the works of the law of Moses. It is the gift of God. Hebrews 12 and verse 2. Faith itself is a gift of God. The very source of our confidence, trust, belief in God, Christ, and the gospel system is the truth of God's word. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. Why? Does that, is that the case? Because of the truth that the Word of God reveals to us. Thus Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And in that great chapter on faith in the letter to the Hebrews, he will say, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Without the knowledge of the Bible, what do you know about heaven? 
Without the knowledge of the Bible, what do you really know about hell? Without the proper knowledge of the Bible, what do you know about sin? And what do you know about salvation? What do you know about grace? What do you know about works? Without proper knowledge of the Bible, we know nothing correctly about those things. Thus, my faith in God as my Heavenly Father and Christ as my Savior and the Son of God. The Holy Spirit is the revealer of the mind of God in the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. And from that book, I learn about all these things. The Father saves us, but He doesn't save us without the Son. The Son saves us, He doesn't save us without the Father. Father and Son save us, but they don't save us without the Spirit. The triune God saves us, but not without the Bible. The Bible saves us, but not without the gospel message found therein. As we rightly divide it, 2 Timothy 2.15. We're saved by baptism. But baptism alone doesn't save a soul. Let that sink in. We're saved by repentance. But repentance alone doesn't save us. We're saved by confessing our faith in Christ, that He's the Son of God. But that alone will save us. And so on you can go. There are a host of things the instructional word of God tells us saves us. And so it is, Peter would write, baptism doth also now save us. And in Acts 10, 48, Peter commanded the believers at the household of Cornelius to be baptized. He what? He commanded them to be baptized. They were brought to belief in Christ as the Son of God by the message Peter preached. Wasn't that enough? They'd received the Word. Won't the Word save you? Yes, but not by itself. Will not preaching the gospel save a person? Yes, but not by itself. Will not belief produced by receiving the gospel and understanding it save you? Yes, but not by itself. Will hearing and believing save you? No, they won't by themselves. Will repentance save you? No, but we're commanded to repent, Acts 17.30 and Luke 13, 3 and 5. It's faith and baptism, faith and obedience, faith and work. Works of Satan, works of the law, works of man? No. But the works are on our part that says, Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. Command, and I will obey. And Jesus would say in his earthly ministry, Why well, call ye me Lord, Lord, and do, it's a work as far as I know, not the things which I say. And he's the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Obedience is action. It's work on my part but not works of Satan or the law of Moses or anything some man thought of. It's the way and the only way anybody can accept what's freely given to us and that we don't deserve. And the love of God through the grace of God by the mercy of God extends to us when what we deserve is eternal damnation. So we need to understand those particular points. All those things are the works of God. Repentance is, as I said, a work of God. Acts 5.31, the teaching there by Peter, Luke records, speaking of Christ, him did God exalt with his right hand to be a prince and a savior. Now listen. And to give, give, that means it's a gift, to give. To give repentance to Israel and remission of sins, Acts 5 and verse 31. And yet I find that one of the things that leads us to repentance, according to Paul, Romans 2, 4, is that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Repentance is the breaking down of our old stubborn will, which is the seed of all sin and rebellion against God. 
That's done when we come to grips with the fact I've sinned and it's my fault and I have nobody to blame but myself. And if I'm to be saved, I throw myself on the mercy of God in the gospel of Christ. And I receive the truth of God that sets me free from sin. And whatever it asks me to do, I'm willing. I'm ready. And thus we have Paul reminding the members of the church at Rome who were, had done these things, they had received the grace of God, that they had obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered them, being then made free from sin. They became the servants of righteousness, Romans 6, 17, 18. And so it is that it took the work on their part. What work? Obedience. Had they believed in Christ? Yes, but belief alone won't save anybody. Had they repented of the sins? Yes, but belief and repentance won't save anybody. Had they confessed their faith in Christ? Assuredly, Romans 10, 10. But those three things standing alone or together won't save anybody. They had to obey the form of doctrine. That's action on their part. What was the form of doctrine? Romans 6, 3, and 4. Buried with Christ in baptism. But whose work was it? Their work? Satan's work? The law of Moses? It's God's work. Can I do God's work? <laughs> I have to do God's work. I must do God's work. I won't go to heaven if I don't do God's work. Thus, when I believe, Jesus said, that's the work of God. When I repent, I'm commanded of God to repent. That's the work of God. When I confess my belief in Christ, the Son of God, that's the work of God. And guess what? When I am baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, that's no work of Satan. That's no work of the law of Moses. No man thought that up. But it's God's work. Do you realize that when a person is baptized, immersed in water by the authority of Christ to obtain the remission of forgiveness of sins, that in reality, by submitting to the commands of God, it is Jesus who's baptizing him? Whose will are we doing? It's his. And the person outside of Christ who wants to get into Christ, wherein are all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, Ephesians 1 must, verse 3, must go through the doorway into Christ. What is it? Galatians 3, 26, 27. We're baptized into Christ. There, <clears throat> there is no other doorway into Christ. You don't believe into Christ? Read your Bible like you ought to in the New Testament in particular, and you'll see rather quickly, there's no, straight, no scripture that says you're baptized or you believe, that you believe into Christ. There's no scripture that says you repent into Christ or confess into Christ. All those are headed toward the right direction, unto, in order to a given end, but a person's only baptized into Christ. That's the doorway. Now, whose works are those? What man thought up the idea that the blood of Christ would forgive sins? Man didn't. What man came up with the idea of belief in Christ, of repentance of sins, of confession of faith in Christ, of being baptized in Christ? No man did. It's not in the law of Moses. Certainly Satan wouldn't want you to do it. All those things are the works of God because they came from the mind of God and it's the way we accept what we don't deserve and cannot merit salvation from sin. There has to be a way that we demonstrate to God we have faith in Him and His system of salvation. Denominations say, well, just believe and you're not doing anything. Well, the Bible says, doesn't it, that belief is a work of God as is repentance and confession of faith and baptism. If not, Peter lied through his teeth. And the Bible's a liar when he says baptism does also now save us. Well, it does or it doesn't. But it does. But God saves us. But baptism saves us. 
it must be that God saves us when as believers who have repented of our sins and confessed our faith in him, we're baptized to be saved. And that's what Jesus said in the Great Commission. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And so it is that uh, the belief that's mentioned in all that we've talked about today is a belief that's built upon of us, saith the Lord, Romans 10, 17. And in that belief, coming from the Word of God, is the teaching from God that we must repent, confess our faith, and be baptized into Christ. And Peter, who preached what he did on the day the church started with the other apostles, his sermons recorded in Acts 2, said to believers, repent, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the reach of sins. You know, to a great many people, we have to say what Jesus said to the persecutor Saul of Tarsus when he appeared to him as he went to Damascus. Remember, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Who art thou, Lord? I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks or the goads. It's hard to fight the truth. It's hard to fight that which is so plain in your own Bible. You know, members of the Church of Christ today did not write any part of the Bible. The Lord's church as it is revealed on the pages of the New Testament is a product of believing and obeying the truth. Roman Catholics have you believe they brought us the Bible. Well, that very claim proves to me they're not what they ought to be or what they claim to be. Because the Word of God is the seed of the kingdom, Luke 8, 11. The Word of God is the sword of the Spirit, Ephesians 6, 17. It's the Word of God believed by individuals and obeyed that produces the church. I see that in Acts 2. When people received with meekness the truth, they believed from the heart and obeyed it. And they were added to the church by the Lord himself, Acts 2, verse 47. And these are the people who gladly received his word. Now, if you're hearing his word and you won't do what they did, and you say, but I gladly received the word of God. No, you don't. I beg to differ with you. If you say, this is the word of God, but you won't be baptized when you know you ought to be, don't you realize you're rejecting the word of God? You're rejecting the way one is saved by God through Christ in the gospel system. So baptism is a work of God. It was commanded, as we've noticed, having been revealed by the Holy Spirit, Acts 2.4 and Acts 2.38. And thus I end where I mentioned a while ago, <coughs> baptism does also now save us it doesn't alone but it does in its proper sphere when one is baptized into Christ for unto in order to the given in of the remission of sins and it's in Christ where all spiritual blessings and heavenly places are located now what are very quickly the works of man the faith only doctrine is a work of man man conjured that up it didn't come from the Bible James himself speaking to people who heard the gospel obeyed it and were members of the church pointed out the principle of a living and active faith when he said even now as Christians to be faithful the faith apart from works is dead being alone well do you think he's talking about works of the law of Moses or meritorious works a works conjured up by man? No, he's talking about the attitude of the child of God and obeying what God said there to do to be faithful Christians. This faith only doctrine was started by man about 1,500 years ago as far as Protestant denominationalism is concerned, as I mentioned in the beginning. It contradicts plainly what the Bible says. James says... James 2, 24, 
Ye see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. That's the only time faith only is mentioned in the New Testament. And you're not justified by it. Why can't people see that? That's as much a part of the Bible as any passage that says we're saved by faith. And no passage that says we're saved by faith says we're saved by faith only. So we see he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. We hear people talking about doing penance. That's a work of man. Some people equate penance with repentance. It's not the same. People who do penance are saying, I'm sorry. And under Roman Catholicism, they may give you various things to do because of the meritorious type of system that it is. But have you ever noticed that Judas Iscariot repented himself, Matthew 27, 3 through 5. He was sorry. You can be sorry all day long that you sinned. That doesn't mean that alone is repentance. Repentance is where you turn from a life of sin, whether it's one or many, and where you set your life on a goal of no longer sinning. In Acts 26, 20, listen, Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet or suitable for repentance. That is, you've proved you've changed. You've had the change of mind and that's short in your life. Mark 7, 7, in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And every preacher that stands in every church pulpit, wherever it is in the world today, and says you outside of Christ can be saved by faith only, he may not know it. He may not understand it. He may be as sincere as a person could be, but he's lying through his teeth. And if you ask him to show you from the Bible where that is there, he cannot do it. Now, he can show me all the passages in the New Testament that says we're saved by faith. As I've said in debate with them, I believe every one of them, and you're wasting time to show me that. I know we're saved by faith. You need to find the passage that says we're saved by faith, O-N-L-Y. And there's only one passage that mentions that, and it says we're not saved by faith only. People will say, well, just confess Christ to be your Savior. God, for Christ's sake, hath pardon your sins. That's what most of them will say. Well, I can't find that in the Bible. Doesn't that bother people? Oh, this word of God's so great. And then they'll say something like that and they can't even find it in the Bible. One is saved after and not before baptism. You're baptized in order to be forgiven of sins. Mark 16, 16, Acts 2, 38. And it's said of Paul who was a believer and repentant. Now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins calling on the name of the Lord. The idea of sprinkling water on somebody and calling it baptism or pouring water on somebody and calling it baptism is foreign to the teaching of the Bible. That's a work of man. Confessing Christ, that's all that's involved, is a work of man. Doing penance is saying I'm sorry and not changing your life. That's a work of man. We've already studied about baptism. It requires a coming to, a going down into, and a coming up out of, Acts 8, 36 through 39. That's water we're talking of. In fact, baptism requires much water, John 3 and verse 23. And the reason why? Because Romans 6, 3 and 4 says baptism is a burial in water. And it must be done from the heart, according to Romans 6, 17 and 18. And only then is one free from alien sins, and a Christian, a member of the Lord's church. Romans 6, 18. These things I mentioned here are truly works of men. Now I close with this. It happens every day and it'll happen to the end of time. God's workings can be resisted. You can say, I know that Jesus said that belief is a work of God, but... Every time you do that, you look a little closer into the pits of hell where you're traveling. Even the works of God, the very source of faith can be rejected. Listen to this. The first preaching cure of Paul and Barnabas. 
And Paul and Barnabas spake out boldly and said to the Jews who had been hearing the gospel, it was necessary that the word of God should first be spoken to you. See ye thrust it from you. Now what happens when you do that? You know the truth, you know it's the word of God, you reject it, and you thrust it from you. Here's what he said. And judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Now think about that. Oh, don't judge me. Are you judgmental? Well, I tell you, the Bible already tells us God's judgment. I already know how to judge things. My own life, anybody else's. It's what's right and wrong, how to become a Christian, who is and who isn't. I also know the standard of judgment or the day of judgment. But I can judge myself unworthy of eternal life. How? Just reject the truth. Some think they can escape the judgment with hardness and penitent hearts, but the Scripture says they're treasuring unto themselves wrath against the day of wrath, Romans 2, 3 through 6, when they do that. And I learned in Jesus' day in John 12, 42, that many believed on Christ, but they refused to confess Him. They were cut off. They were acceptable. Now think about that. I believe Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. But I'm scared to death to confess that openly where people can hear it. But maybe God will receive me. He won't. Because he says, if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. Brethren, the door that enters the Lord's church, the very moment salvation is a received. The very moment God in his mind says your sins and iniquities are blotted out is the moment the believer who's repented of sins and confessed faith in Christ is immersed in water to obtain the remission of sins. If you haven't done that, I don't care what reasons you're baptized. If you were not baptized for the remission of sins, your baptism is not according to the scriptures. Baptism is the act of obedience which brings one into Christ, Romans 6, 3. Now, what do you think is going to happen to a person who refuses that and says, well, I believe God and the Bible and Christ the Son of God and I've confessed Him. I've asked Him to come into my heart. You almost can see Christ looking at somebody like that on the day of judgment says, but didn't you believe the rest of what I told you? It's just as plain as all those passages about hearing and believing, repenting and confessing. Why wouldn't you be baptized for the remission of sins? And if he were to tell them why, he would simply say this. You didn't believe me on that point. That's why you didn't do it. And as a child of God, if you've sinned, you know you've sinned, more than one sin. Then you have to repent, Acts 17, 30, and confess those sins to God that you might be restored. Now, if you refuse to do that, then you're no different from the person who refuses to obey the total plan of salvation. You're just saying, well, I don't think I really have to do that. I hear these people over the years I've preached say, come forward sometimes and say, well, if I have sinned, they need to be told to go sit out back in the chair and when they can come forward and say, I have sinned, and here's the sin, I ask forgiveness. Because if I have sinned, what can, I can't find anything in the New Testament that says a Christian will confess such a thing. If I have sinned. You know whether you sinned or you didn't? You know whether it's public or private. And you know who else knows it? God does. So if we would be humble and receive the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth on whether it's becoming a Christian or gaining remission of sins, having sinned as a child of God, then we will receive with meekness the truth and humbly obey it, lay aside our pride, our arrogance, or whatever it is, our stubbornness, and just simply submit to Christ. All of us have to. It's the way of righteousness. It's the way of heaven. If you're subject to the call of Christ, the invitation of our Lord, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.